All right, a very good morning. I'm glad you're still with us here on Morning at Time TV. For those that are just joining us, welcome on board. We're glad that we now have all hands on deck. Today is an important day because it's a World Refugee Day, a day that is dedicated to ensuring that all interventions that are aimed at ensuring that the refugees, wherever they are in the world, are living a decent and sustainable life. Here in Uganda, we come on the backdrop on this particular day of the fact that there are increasing challenges and some bits of gaps here and there when it comes to the plight of uh, refugees. The multi-sectoral approaches that are being undertaken, of course, under the ages of the government are multifaceted. The agencies, civil society organizations, government, but also communities themselves are important in ensuring that this particular question is uh, addressed. The United States, through the State Department's Bureau of Population, Refugees and Migration, PRM, and USAID, is providing more than $25 million in additional humanitarian funding to the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees and the World Food Program to assist refugees and asylum seekers in Uganda. PRM is contributing more than $14 million to UNHCR, while USAID is providing up to a $1 million to WFP. This additional funding brings the United States total humanitarian assistance to Uganda to more than $178 million since the beginning of the fiscal year 2023. Uganda has hosted refugees and asylum seekers since before its independence from the United Kingdom in 1962. In the early 1940s, we hosted several Polish refugees who fled Europe during the World War II. In the early 40s, uh, after an uprising rather against Rwanda's Tutsi monarchy in 1959, tens of thousands of Tutsis fled into the country. And as we commemorate this day, World Refugee Day, we want to reflect on the journey that has been, but most importantly, the successes as well as the challenges that the nation is uh, facing. And to help us understand what is happening on ground and with what is no doubt a huge and eye view picture is the U.S. Ambassador to Uganda, His Excellency William Paul. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Chris. Good morning. Good morning, and it's a pleasure to have you on Thank Morning you. at NTV, a very first time. Indeed. We hope we can see you a lot more. Thank you. I look forward to it. All right. In light of the fact that today is World Refugee Day, it brings into mind so many aspects. Mm -hmm. But we shall be, of course, breaking them down right. and understanding exactly where we are at. But from the point of view of Washington, right. what is the refugee policy right now? with regard to interventions in helping Uganda deal with what is no doubt a very big challenge in settling people who have been moved by right. factors including conflict. No, absolutely. Uh, first of all, just thank you for the opportunity to be here today and this very important uh, World Refugee Day, a day that we have the opportunity to mm. recognize uh, the bravery and the resilience of refugees uh, as well as the skills and opportunities that they bring uh, to the countries that they're hosted in, uh, and recognize as well the partnerships that right. uh, are uh, essential to responding to the challenges that you outlined. And mm. it is, unfortunately, uh, becoming an increasingly difficult uh, world environment for uh, refugees. We've seen conflicts around the world uh, grow. Mm. We've seen even here in uh, Central and East Africa, an expansion of the number of refugees uh, that have been uh, forced to leave their homes. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a growing number have uh, needed to come to countries such as Uganda. Uh, and again, on a day like today, World Refugee Day, it's important to recognize Uganda's role historically as mm -hmm. a host country, mm -hmm. the largest host country in Africa That's for right. refugees. Mm -hmm. And so from the United States perspective, uh, today is an is a opportunity to reflect on and to look forward as well on the essential nature of the partnerships that we must continue to, to build mm -hmm. to uh, help these folks that are leaving uh, very difficult circumstances. Uh, to work with host communities to mm -hmm. see what they can do to um, both receive refugees but also benefit from mm -hmm. uh, having them in their communities and then work towards a mm -hmm. day where refugees can voluntarily return to their homes uh, 
or uh, be resettled in, in certain circumstances to other places. Around All right. The world. In line with the theme that has been chosen by the international community, solidarity with refugees for a world where refugees are welcomed. Increasingly, as nations continue to grapple with the geopolitics of the day, many are being seen to want to first attend to their challenges before they can attend to any challenges that are occasioned upon them by the outside world. What are the key issues that, for example, across the region, of course, uh, being that uh, Uganda works uh, very closely with other countries mm -hmm. for the refugees that come here. When we speak about solidarity with refugees, mm -hmm. what exactly does this imply? Mm -hmm. Is there an attempt to isolate? Mm -hmm. And if it is, mm -hmm. where is it coming from? Mm -hmm. No, I think absolutely solidarity is the key message in that mm -hmm. refugees uh, and the host communities uh, that they're living in, their solidarity there, the opportunity to work together mm -hmm. uh, for economic growth, uh, for opportunities. Just as one example, the United States is a donor uh, here in Uganda supporting over 50% of all assistance mm. uh, in the country, nearly 1 billion US dollars, 3.7 trillion shillings over the last five years. Uh, of that money that's not only benefiting over a million and a half refugees, that's but also right. nearly 3 million Ugandans uh, in the sense that the schools, the 300 plus schools that we support, the 100 plus clinics, mm -hmm. those also attend to uh, Ugandan host communities. Uh, the food that is purchased yeah. to feed uh, refugees also is bought from Ugandan uh, suppliers. So there's solidarity there as well as more broadly, and you reference the countries in the region, working together uh, to address the conflicts that are generating uh, the circumstances that are forcing individuals to leave their homes. Yeah. We must work more closely together uh, with other governments and with other partners to reduce those conflicts so that there are uh, less refugees uh, fleeing uh, from their places of origin and going to countries such as Uganda. Okay, with regard to a uh, very important aspect you mentioned, the ability for humanitarian assistance, including the provision of food to be targeted, mm -hmm. a statement by the Honorable Minister for Relief, Disaster Preparedness and Refugees, mm -hmm. Hilary Oneik, that mm -hmm. has been carried by the Daily Monitor here. Mm -hmm. Let me just read some excerpt. As a result, humanitarian assistance, such as the provision of food to refugees and asylum seekers, has significantly reduced mm -hmm. and uh, with the rollout of prioritization approach for food cash assistance to refugees and asylum seekers where this assistance is based on vulnerability levels. There are two aspects here. Mm -hmm prioritization approach mm -hmm. for food cash assistance mm -hmm. and then vulnerability mm -hmm. levels. Refugees may not understand the prioritization approach, right. nor will they be comfortable with mm -hmm. vulnerability levels. They mm -hmm. see themselves as one. Mm -hmm. And if they are, there is a bit of difference in what one gets mm -hmm. uh, from another. Mm -hmm. The one who gets less mm -hmm. or is less attended might think they are being uh, segregated. I don't know how this synchronization yeah. is being done yeah. by the various stakeholders. Is this something that you can talk about? Well, it's a, it's a challenging situation based upon obviously limited resources. And uh, I know the World Food Program and other agencies that are responsible for distributing the food that is purchased or supported by donors such as the United States yeah. have to make make tough decisions uh, given the growing number of refugees mm. and the finite amount of or limited amount of resources. The resources are being strained first and foremost by other conflicts around the world. Uh, we've seen them in, in many parts of the world where the needs are also uh, very high. Uh, and so looking at the totality of uh, the number of refugees and as it's grown uh, globally, uh, tough decisions have had to be made to reduce mm. the number of uh, of resources or uh, the, ref the, the, um, the, the rations that are provided. And yeah. ultimately what that means is looking at vulnerability. So children, uh, communities that may be more recently arrived could be more vulnerable, for example, than more well-established yeah. uh, refugee communities. Mm -hmm. So yes, it's understandable that there can be uh, different perspectives on why there has to be prioritization. 
but at the same time looking at a very difficult outlook of uh, limited resources and very high need, uh, the, the prudent and required uh, steps that have been taken is to ensure that the most vulnerable persons uh, receive as much assistance as possible. And uh, the key to, I think, breaking out of this challenging system is to look at livelihoods, to look at ways that refugees can take steps uh, towards self-sufficiency with support from partners such as the United States and others. And so that's one of the reasons we're very invested in vocational skills and developing yeah. uh, the tools so that refugees and members of the host communities in which they live in have the tools to learn jobs, uh, skills, to learn local language, uh, to be able to find um, paths towards self-sufficiency mm. to be able to complement uh, any sort of food assistance that they're already receiving. Okay, uh, let's uh, keep it to self-reliance. Uh, mm -hmm. There is what's being described as the self-reliance model that critically mm -hmm. envisages investments in livelihood sector for refugees and host communities. The average Ugandan out there might not understand what the self-reliance model right. is in as far as uh, refugee management or practice uh, right. is. Do you mind? Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so it starts with skills. Yeah. Right. It starts with the, the uh, taking on skills that allow refugees uh, to either uh, tailor clothes, prepare mm. food, uh, do uh, cosmetic, b small yeah. businesses, yeah. things that uh, will give them income, sources of income, to be able to have that self-sufficiency and uh, resiliency in the uh, context in which mm. you describe, which is less uh, access to, to resources and greater demands for those resources that do exist. Uh, and that has a double benefit. It has a benefit when those skills are uh, passed to refugees, one for themselves, mm. but also for the communities in which they live in. Uh, just to give you one example, I, I visited a vocational center that we're supporting uh, just a few blocks away from uh, the embassy and uh, met with a, a number of refugees mm. who have developed skills uh, that have started their own businesses that are now not only employing other refugees but also Ugandan uh, citizens in the local community. One lady I met was had been here for over 10 years, mm. had her own beauty salon now and had over a, a dozen local employees and so that's a win-win uh, and again an opportunity for not only refugees to find a path towards self-sufficiency but also uh, uh, the host communities. All right. There's been a, a series of meetings and uh, conferences that have been organized across the globe, mm -hmm. uh, particularly to help uh, Uganda in its effort to ensure that some, many of these refugees are well taken care of and pledges have Indeed. been made over right. time. Right. What's the status of the pledges that were made by countries including France, Japan, Colombia, Jordan in light of uh, the co-convener uh, conference that was held in December 2023? Well, I believe there's been a strong uh, backing of support, uh, mm. of continued support for Uganda and for other uh, refugee hosting countries, uh, not only through the Global Refugee Forum in December, but mm. uh, going forward. Uh, again, both in immediate assistance, but also yeah. in strategies to help develop uh, self-sufficiency, reliance, integration of services as yeah. well. Uh, again, the more efficient we can be in assistance providing mm. with host country, in this case Ugandan institutions, the more effective will be and the less duplicative will be in uh, assistance not going to those who most need it. Mm -hmm. Also uh, developing ways that again provide a pathway to livelihoods. That's really the key to to teach someone how to fish versus just giving them yeah, the fish. That's model. right. And mm -hmm. so that ultimately uh, is a pathway that I think we believe uh, is viable. Uh, we have endorsed as the United States and many other countries uh, the goals that uh, the Ugandan government has set forward mm -hmm. uh, for uh, uh, building a path towards. Uh, livelihoods and, and self-sufficiency and to greater integration and I think that we have to be as well as be more local in the mm. work that we're doing I think those are ways that we can tackle what is a very challenging uh, current environment for All refugees. Right. Allow me to transition into the various forms of displaced persons mm -hmm. for which refugees are but just a part. Asylum seekers mm -hmm. when people move from one country to another as a result of uh, factors including conflict. Right. Many will be seen on arrival as refugees, mm -hmm. but when they are actually mm -hmm. asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. I do not know whether the 
process of uh, there's an, a process that helps to weed out who is a refugee, who is an asylum seeker, mm -hmm. who is uh, internally displaced, who is a returnee, mm -hmm. in order to ensure that, may, for example, an asylum seeker may not necessarily want to be in Uganda right. if they've been driven from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. They may want to go to the UK. They mm -hmm. may want to go to the United States. Right. Has that been taken care of Absolutely. to look at these people who've been displaced, not just as refugees, but some that may be asylum seekers. Is the United States attending to that question? Absolutely. No, it's a great question, and it is one that the United States uh, is very uh, deeply involved in. In fact, the, the, the top country for uh, refugees and mm -hmm. asylum seekers in the world is the United States. That's right. Uh, over the last 50 years, more than 3.6 million refugees and asylum seekers have mm -hmm. been resettled in the United States, more than any other country in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, just this year, uh, the target is over 125,000 uh, refugees and asylum seekers uh, being resettled in the United States. Uh, but there's two sides to the to the issue. One mm -hmm. is resettlement yeah. uh, and and providing a permanent place of refuge for asylum seekers, as you note, individuals who, uh, based upon their circumstances or the circumstances in their country see no viable way to return to their homes, mm. they're most eligible for uh, being uh, able to be approved for resettlement and asylum in a country such as the United States. Mm. But the other part of the issue is whether uh, eventually individuals can return voluntarily to their homes. And we also uh, finance and support uh, refugees when they are able to uh, safely to return to their homes. And even since the beginning of this year, the United States has been supporting, working with uh, UN partners, uh, the Ugandan government, for uh, help to Burundian mm -hmm. refugees who have been living here in Uganda for a number of years to be able to return safely to their homes. So each month there's been more, uh, at least one convoy of hundreds of uh, Burundian refugees being able to return to their homes. So both the asylum seekers and the resettlement in other countries such mm -hmm. as the United States, but also helping refugees hopefully someday for those who can and want to safely uh, return to their home to be able to do so. All right. So the question of asylum seekers does uh, uh, slightly take us into the aspect of uh, the constant bouts of war mm -hmm. and uh, conflict that caused insecurity across the region. Of course, Uganda being seen as one country that has been uh, uh, stable and is able to offer the kind of security that many people are running uh, to, to get. But what the underlying causes of these kind of movements and displacements. The United States finds itself at uh, the forefront, for example, guaranteeing security mm -hmm. across mm -hmm. the region. Mm -hmm. There have been incursions by the uh, Houthis in Yemen, mm -hmm. and it's believed that their hand is very large mm -hmm. in Sudan, for example. Mm -hmm. Sudan alone has occasioned upon us uh, refugees uh, since the beginning of the year to the tune of uh, 3,000 plus. Yeah. And that is a question that should be addressed, not necessarily in terms of uh, finding money to help mm -hmm. Uganda deal with them, mm -hmm. but to be able to stop the factors that are leading to this kind of movement. Right. The war in Sudan right now mm -hmm. has completely mm -hmm. uh, destabilized the region beyond uh, what the initial wars, for example, in Somalia and uh, Ethiopia have done. Mm -hmm. What is the discussion like mm -hmm. within the uh, strategic powers mm -hmm. uh, dimension? How are you dealing with this to be able to address not only dealing right. with the refugees, but Indeed. most importantly, right. ending war? No, you're absolutely right, Chris. I mean, the key to addressing refugee challenges here in Uganda and mm -hmm. around the region and the world is uh, to address the conflicts that are driving people from their homes. And mm -hmm. Sudan is uh, an unfortunate example uh, yeah. of a particular circumstance over the last year, year and a half, of which so many people have been forced and continue to be forced to leave uh, their country uh, for fear of violence or for mm -hmm. being victims of violence. So the United States has been very clear, and I know other partners have as well, including uh, Uganda, that uh, the conflict there must come to an end as soon as possible, mm. uh, that civilians should not be victims of the violence of any political conflict that are occurring, 
Uh, and the United States has been very clear uh, in our commitment in working with uh, stakeholders, uh, including Uganda, but many other countries as well, to support dialogue, to support a, a process which brings the parties at conflict uh, to the table uh, wow. so that uh, the violence can end as soon as possible. Unfortunately, it has been very, very difficult to do so. Unfortunately, the violence continues, uh, the humanitarian crisis continues, and consequently, uh, the number of people who have been forced to flee continues to grow. And so we do, uh, while we try to uh, support as much as possible, I think every country in the region and uh, internationally have been uh, responding to the best of their abilities to attend to uh, the sheer number of people who have been forced to leave Sudan. Uh, the core uh, issue at hand is to bring that violence to an end as soon as possible. All right. Uh, let's return to the aspect of uh, funding because it is as broad as it is uh, pertinent. When it comes to the ability of the United States to roll out the funding, uh, uh, the resource envelope, many have seen that the reduction in money that is sent, or rather a portion to Uganda to help in the refugee question, is not necessarily down mm -hmm. to the fact that the United States is either constrained mm -hmm. or lacking in yeah. this money, but it's down to rule of law and governance. Mm -hmm. And this comes, this brings us rather to the question of the recent uh, developments with regard to a series of legislative aspects within Uganda, including mm -hmm. the Anti-Homosexuality mm -hmm. Act uh, that has occasioned the tightening mm -hmm. of uh, the tap mm -hmm. by the powers in Washington and uh, London. Mm -hmm. I don't know, the questions in there are very many mm -hmm. and varied, but within your yeah. own uh, seat as the ambassador. Sure. Uh, what is happening right yeah. now? Are we seeing a reduction in funding because the United States is also mm -hmm. apportioning mm -hmm. the money to its own challenges or Uganda is being punished mm -hmm. for legislating its way? Well, I think the first thing to, to clarify is actually the assistance has not gone down for mm -hmm. uh, Uganda. The Uni uh, United States continues to fund nearly one billion U.S. dollars, mm -hmm. again, nearly 3.7 trillion uh, Ugandan shillings annually for assistance across the board. That's Refugee right. assistance is one area, a mm. uh, significant area. Uh, public health is another major area of assistance that the United States provides, particularly in fighting HIV and AIDS, mm. as well as malaria, tuberculosis, and other communicable diseases. Right. Education and other areas. So uh, I think there's a bit of confusion at times okay. that the, the amount of resources have been quite stable. Um, our commitment to the Ugandan people remains very, very strong over 60 years of support, and the United States continues to be Uganda's largest bilateral assistance partner. Uh, of course, resources at the same time globally are uh, very strained, yeah. uh, and in part that is due to the reality, fiscal realities in the United States, mm -hmm. uh, other crises. Uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine has generated a, you know, a huge amount of need um, and displacement of persons, etc. Uh, other conflicts in the region as well, certainly in Gaza, uh, where lots of resources have been directed for humanitarian response. Uh, all of those put pressure on uh, resources, but so far the United States has remained very uh, committed mm -hmm. to partnering and supporting the Ugandan people in these areas, as well as the refugees that the Ugandan people uh, host. Now, we do, of course, have yeah. uh, concerns in these mm -hmm. other areas that you've mentioned. Uh, we've been very clear uh, speaking out against corruption and support of rule of law mm -hmm. and transparency. Uh, we have. Uh, spoken out in support of democracy uh, and, and independent media and the role of civil society in being able to uh, conduct itself. And those have resulted in actions, and mm -hmm. actions that we've taken. Uh, unfortunately, the suspension of the African Growth and Opportunity Act, uh, trade benefits uh, at the end of last year is one example of that. Mm -hmm. uh, those are, in our law, um, contingent upon meeting criteria for good governance, uh, transparency, fighting corruption, supporting uh, human rights, and when those criteria um, are not met, uh, we are forced by our law to suspend those benefits. So those are some examples where we have taken uh, actions, mm -hmm. but in terms of assistance, uh, we've continued very, uh, to very much the same level. Oh, of course, that's uh, very commendable on the part of the people of uh, the United States, of course, as envisaged and seen by the works of uh, the government. Allow me to stay on the aspect of uh, corruption. Mm -hmm. The refugee economy alone, 
is one that of course has a lot of money moving up uh, and about and in recent years we've seen at the office of the prime minister a scandal after scandal where money that is supposed to go into refugee interventions has been either misappropriated or rather plainly stolen mm -hmm. and that is something that uh, has occasioned a black spot mm -hmm. on any refugee interventions for a country that is uh, acclaimed across the globe uh, for being very receptive and accommodative. Corruption with regard to monies that go for refugee interventions. How is the United States handling this? Well, absolutely. It's a very challenging situation whenever uh, resources are lost or taken or stolen through corruption, mm -hmm. particularly from uh, the most vulnerable. And this circumstance of the, that you're mentioning is from refugees who mm -hmm. are at the most vulnerable circumstances uh, of food insecurity or other uh, challenges. So obviously supporting transparency, supporting the policies, the practices uh, that allow resources to get to refugees with the least number of people's hands or, or steps in the process mm -hmm. anywhere can actually reduce uh, transparency, for example, or reduce, sorry, corruption. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, for example, uh, a lot of the funding that we do now for food mm -hmm. is direct cash transfers to refugees. For example, money transferred from our programs uh, to the cell phones of refugees. Oh, refugees so yeah. they there's no middle person between them so that they are able to buy the food in mm. local stores. I went to uh, the Nakavali settlement uh, a few months mm. ago and I mm. saw refugees getting the money on their phone and going into a store owned by a Ugandan shopkeeper buying Ugandan products with that food and being able to use that food for their um, their families and mm -hmm. so ways that we can use technology uh, and digital processes to make it as transparent as proce uh, process as possible as well as as direct process as possible mm -hmm. uh, has a ten has a uh, propensity to reduce corruption okay has there been any deliberate effort for example or uh, uh, intervention for example to repatriate refugees that are not asylum seekers mm -hmm. To the United States. We've seen uh, the UK uh, undertake uh, an understanding with Rwanda, for mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. that has some of the those that cannot be accommodated in mm -hmm. the UK brought to Rwanda mm -hmm. in a specific arrangement that is, of course, down to the memorandum of understanding between the two nations. Mm -hmm. Has the United States over the years been able to take on a few refugees mm -hmm. in a bid to help Uganda? deal with this budget? Absolutely. The United States, as I mentioned um, a mm -hmm. moment ago, is, is the largest destination country for cool. asylum seekers mm -hmm. and refugees, uh, over 3.7 million over the last uh, five decades. On an annual basis, around 100 to 125,000 mm -hmm. individuals are resettled wow. in, the in the United States. From yeah. Uganda, on an annual basis, around 5,000 refugees. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it varies depending upon circumstances and so forth, but on average, that's about the number of refugees here in Uganda that are resettled to the U.S. Mm -hmm. We do not have programs that send people back. Okay. Uh, we are a destination country, mm -hmm. um, but uh, and we've actually taken measures to try to accelerate and to facilitate. We have a program uh, that we've even launched in the last uh, few months to uh, make it more um, uh, feasible for uh, individuals to be resettled smoothly in the United States. We had a large response to that uh, and we've been we've put some of that on pause for the moment just because of the large number of applications to work through. Mm -hmm. um, but the commitment of the United States is actually to become more uh, nimble, to become more um, uh, efficient in being able to resettle individuals more quickly. All right. Uh, Your Excellency, we are nearing uh, the bottom of the hour. We're going to have to go for a break very shortly. But before we do that, allow me to ask this question. Mm -hmm. A person who understands uh, Uganda's status as a country that uh, has hosted refugees and continues uh, to be held in high regard mm -hmm. would think this question is not necessary. Mm -hmm. But are you satisfied with the levels of uh, human rights observation across communities where refugees are? I think it's a very cha at first it's important to note yes mm -hmm. Uganda is a model for um, receiving and welcoming refugees. Uh, and allowing refugees to integrate into local communities. That's right. Uh, and so I think that's very important to keep in mind. 
of course human rights for all is very important for Ugandan citizens, for refugees, for everyone. And ultimately, uh, there are always protection challenges. These are vulnerable individuals. These are young women, these are children, these are individuals from ethnic or uh, minority, religious minorities. These are That's individuals right. who are leaving their homes because they've been persecuted or discriminated against. Uh -huh. So ensuring that their human rights uh, and their basic rights are respected uh, and making sure that they are not further uh, discriminated against or uh, victimized is of course essential. And I, I think uh, working closely with Ugandan authorities, with UN agencies, with NGOs, donor partners, we should always be cognizant of the importance of keeping in mind that individuals who have already been victims, uh, that their rights are, are protected and are prioritized. All right. Your Excellency, U.S. Ambassador to Uganda, William Pope. It's time now for a short break, but of course, we shall be returning and uh, the conversation on uh, refugees in light of today, the 20th of June, being World Refugee Day, will continue continue here in Ernest. Do stay with us. We'll be right back. Are you a warrior battling sickle cell disease, a supportive friend, or a stakeholder dedicated to bringing hope to these warriors? Join us at the third annual sickle cell convention organized by Raising Hope International Friends Limited under the theme Innovation in Sickle Cell Care. The convention will be held on July 5th at Ginger City Town Hall starting at 8 a.m. For inquiries, please call 0779-625-932. Sponsored by... Welcome to Nation Courier, where your parcels find their express lane to their destination. Are you tired of waiting days for your deliveries? Fed up with missed deadlines and lost packages? Fear no more because Nation Courier is here to revolutionize your delivery experience. At Nation Courier, we understand the speed and reliability. With our express delivery service, your packages are in safe hands, racing towards their destination with lightning speed across the city and the country with a swift tracking system. Contact us on 0705-884-433 or visit our offices at Airtel House, Plot 40, Wampeo Avenue, Kampala, to deliver countrywide. Nation Korea, where speed meets reliability. Your express delivery solution awaits. Nation Korea is a brand of Monitor Publications Limited. Chitufu, blue band awomela kumugati. Na ye, obanda chumanya awomela ne kubidala. Blue band mukoso soksiga, oksika, tani koksika, noktavula. Blue band wakufumba, vaku baking, vaku teka musupu, no karibida. Muloju matoke, kukaunga, nengege, chitufu. Kuchancha kulanch, kuchabu no snack, buwa mububu watu kwa mkueko. Communications Consumer Parliament, an initiative designed to empower consumers in the communications sector by providing a platform for dialogue and engagement with industry stakeholders who include policymakers, regulators, operators, the business community, consumer organizations, academia, and the media. This year, the CCP and awareness activities will target the informal sector, small and medium enterprises. Join us for a live broadcast of the 14th edition of the Communications Consumer Parliament this Thursday, 20th June 2024, under the theme Promoting Impactful ICTs, live on NTV Uganda. Follow the conversation using the hashtag CCP14, hashtag mobile money fraud, hashtag fraud, hashtag illegitimate devices. This is organized by Uganda Communications Commission. On the next episode is brought to you by Boom Chakala. <laughs> Boom Chiki. Boom Chakala. On the next episode. Don't look at me like that. The thing is, if you already helped me when I asked you to, I wouldn't need to do it. I don't have a single penny, please. You see, nobody needs to find out. I'll return it later on, I promise. So please, just don't get upset with me. You know how much I love you. St. Jude, will you give me permission, huh? I assume you've thrown that woman out by now. She's with Yuri in her bedroom. So what, Serio? 
Does this mean she can go in and out of the house whenever she wants to? Okay, stop, Julieta. Please change that tone because you're becoming a real pain now. Hey, stop it already. What's happening here? That jerk had beaten up Bongo. Take him away. Well, I'm still a little bit depressed. On the next episode... Boom Chakala! Grab a Rock Boom, check under the cap, energize and win smartphones, flat screen TVs, Rock Boom gear, motorbikes and millions! I mean millions of cash! What you see is what you win! Boom Chiki! Boom Chakala! Welcome back. We're glad you're still with us here. It's the Kickstarter segment of uh, Morning at NTV, and uh, we are speaking, in t uh, rather interrogating the refugee response in Uganda, the United States' commitment to the welfare of those that we are managing and uh, accommodating here in the country. We have with us on set the U.S. Ambassador to Uganda, His Excellency William Pope, who is uh, joining us for the very first time. Uh, like I said earlier at the beginning, we hope uh, we shall see him more often so that we can and interrogate uh, some of these issues with regard to the position of uh, the United States. But let keep, let's keep it to the refugee question. We have a report here that is dated 2023. The hashtag is US report to UG. Uh, do you mind uh, taking us through exactly what this is? All I see is toward a healthy, prosperous, secure, democratic, and inclusive Uganda. What's the report about? Absolutely. It's a report that we put together on an annual basis, and it's very aptly named our report to the Ugandan people, because mm. part of our responsibility is to be very clear and transparent about what the United States, as Uganda's largest international assistance partner, is doing for and with the Ugandan people. Mm. Uh, and so our goals, as outlined in the report, is for a healthier, more prosperous, more secure um, Uganda. And okay. the Ugandan people, uh, partnering with the American people, uh, I think are achieving great goals. Uh -huh. uh, and as I noted earlier, uh, about almost one billion US dollars in assistance annually uh -huh. here, implemented primarily by Ugandan non-governmental organizations. organizations yeah. uh, so 98% of all that assistance is going through non-governmental and international organizations. But even within that group, over two-thirds are Ugandan NGOs. Mm -hmm. So these are Ugandan uh, leaders and individuals working in their communities mm -hmm. uh, in health, in education, uh, in livelihoods. Uh, all over the country, too, and I think it's important to note too. that our programs reach every district in Uganda. All right. uh, and so ultimately this report tries to, in a snapshot, capture some of the results of the impact of our work together. All right, uh, we shall be delving a little bit deeper into it, but well, let's first exhaust the refugee question, of course in light of uh, your assistance with regard to the uh, refugees that are coming into the country. There is the aspect of urban refugees. Mm -hmm. The average urban refugee in Uganda doesn't look like a refugee. Mm -hmm. Many times he or, he or she is pretty much able to go about business and uh, find themselves a decent housing. And it has created the question, are urban refugees mm -hmm. treated better? Mm -hmm. Or treated better is perhaps a wrong word. Are they attended to mm -hmm. differently mm -hmm. uh, from those that are in the camps or other settlement areas that are far flung? Yeah, I think ultimately the assistance and the support that is provided is oftentimes more significant in the settlement areas. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, the difference that you note is many individuals who choose to move to uh, urban areas can oftentimes be individuals who come with more skills or become uh, come with more uh, background That's that, right. that translates into mm -hmm. finding a job, uh, starting a business, being engaged in the local community. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a testament, I think, to the model that uh, Uganda's refugee response uh, 
is, and it's a, it's unique. It's not the only. It's one of the few countries in the region that handles uh, the circumstances that way, and it's one, something that we applaud, which is to allow refugees to leave settlements and to integrate as much yeah. as possible, while they hopefully develop the skills and the capabilities to uh, take care of themselves, but also potentially someday be able yeah. to return to their homes. Okay, all right. I think that is uh, pretty much uh, understandable. Of course, if you are a degree holder and uh, you are forced to move from one country to the other it will be easier for you to begin to look for a job mm -hmm. than any person that is not uh, privileged with that kind of uh, skill set now the united states supports a hundred plus civil society organizations mm -hmm. in the country and civil society organizations are at the core of uh, interventions especially mm -hmm. in refugee communities. Right. But over the last two years, there have been significant challenges mm -hmm. in the ability of some of these organizations to do their job. Mm -hmm. The civic space is shrinking. Mm -hmm. Funding to the civil society has drastically reduced as a result of factors that you spoke about earlier, mm -hmm. but also within their own internal uh, dynamics. When it comes to the democratic governance facility that was, uh, of course, uh, taken out of uh, operation, mm -hmm. That must have affected a lot of the civil society organizations that you are working with mm -hmm. in order to be able to help refugees who might need legal right. aid right. and uh, clinics. Right. What's the way forward? How do we deal with this very, we, very pertinent it issue? It is a very challenging uh, environment and uh, civil society and non-governmental organizations are a fundamental uh, pillar, I think, in mm -hmm. any democratic society as That's well right. as uh, a platform for assistance reaching those who are most in need. Mm. It's only logical that local entities, local organizations know who needs the assistance, knows how best to shape that assistance. Mm. Uh, and when you uh, make it let more difficult for such organizations to operate, mm. we're actually harming our ability collectively uh, to meet those needs. We're harming the ability to build a more prosperous future, to improve the public health, to improve security, etc. So um, civil society and non-governmental organizations are partners. And we certainly, from the U.S. perspective, believe as much space uh, as possible for them to operate, mm -hmm. uh, to be able to continue to do their important work in health, in education, in livelihoods, in good governance, in supporting transparency, and all the other areas uh, is fundamental to mm. building a more prosperous future. All right, let me keep it to the organizations that are intervening. It's pretty much uh, challenge after challenge, and uh, climate change today completely topples uh, the uh, aspects of intervention and uh, what to do, when to do. Refugee communities are hosted in some of the most disaster prone areas Indeed. in the country. I don't know whether there has been a deliberate shift mm -hmm. and uh, adding specific aspects onto the interventions that are being done mm -hmm. with consideration yes. of climate change as a standalone factor Absolutely. in their lives. There has indeed and uh, we've worked in a number of areas that help particularly with food security, help mm. uh, with environmental protection. You know, one of the biggest challenges for refugees and, and local communities who host is uh, cutting wood and, and creating charcoal for burning in cook stoves and mm. for uh, support. That re results in deforestation. So if you yeah. can help address uh, those needs uh, that prevents degradation of the land, which mm. leads to erosion, which leads to less yields for uh, local crops, uh, you can have uh, a positive impact. Mm -hmm. And you can also slow down the spread of climate change or, or the right. impact. So that's one area, for mm -hmm. example. Um, community gardens and ways that allow people to uh, produce food closer to their homes or in their, uh, in their communities immediately. That also reduces uh, the impact of transportation. It builds food security mm -hmm. um, and again helps mitigate some of the contributors to climate change. So there's a number of ways that we're investing our resources, working with local partners and with refugee and host communities mm -hmm. uh, to try to mitigate some of those challenges. Unfortunately, as you note, uh, the more that climate change has an impact on weather patterns, on uh, 
even public health issues. We're That's seeing right. new varieties or new mm -hmm. expansions of mosquitoes that lead to more malaria, which leads to more public health challenges. Mm -hmm. We need to be very cognizant of how the intersection between climate change and these other challenges uh, can be addressed. All right. In light of uh, World Refugee Day today, I know there are commemoration events that are going to be held. Has there been uh, an attempt by government to deliberately ensure that going forward, there is going to be a new way of doing things that doesn't play into the donor fatigue, mm -hmm. that doesn't uh, play into what could be a bit of boredom mm -hmm. on, the asp on the part of those who are intervening. What new changes are being propped mm -hmm. by the United States? Because a day like the World Refugee Day does not only offer us an opportunity to see what refugees are up to, what they are going through, how they are being treated, but most significantly to bend the arc yes. of development for humanity and growth on their own part towards a very sustainable path. No, absolutely. You're uh, certainly correct. That, I, that should be our goal. We really need to be forward looking. And uh, the Ugandan government uh, very clearly articulated in the run-up to the Global Refugee Forum in December of last year mm. a series of goals uh, which the United States and, and many other countries have endorsed uh, to integrate That's services, right. uh, mm. support for refugees with uh, public institutions, with public programs, you know, and health. So that a, a clinic that is being supported by the Ministry of Health, that is also being supported by donors for refugees, for mm. example, can work together to not be duplicative so that all members of the community are being received. That's just a very micro example. Okay. Uh, but that integration is one area. Localization is mm. another focus. So we're working more locally um, with uh, communities and with non-governmental organizations and local government uh, to make sure that the assistance is most efficiently delivered. Mm. And finally, livelihoods, a mm. focus on, again, taking that step from just immediate humanitarian assistance to, to development. development. And yeah. development that leads to individuals having the skills, the capabilities, uh, and the framework so that they can take care of themselves uh, while hopefully the day comes that they can return home. And so. Uganda's uh, goals are uh, in those areas are goals that we support and we see now more than ever in this mm. World Refugee Day uh, as an opportunity to reinforce and carry forward. All right, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, we are nearing the final bend of our discussion and I would be remiss if I do not say congratulations on your appointment as uh, United States Envoy in uh, the country. Over the last uh, eight months, yes. is it eight or nine, nine. that nine. you have held the <laughs> office, uh, how do you find the atmosphere in Uganda? Yeah. Oh, I've loved uh, meeting Ugandans. Mm. It's been so welcoming. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, living and serving uh, in Kenya years ago and okay. everyone told me you must go to Uganda you must meet oh, Ugandans wow. and so uh, <laughs> I really uh, had that as a goal uh, and I'm so happy that I'm actually here and have a chance mm. uh, to experience Ugandan hospitality I've had the privilege of traveling around the country uh, in more and nearly a dozen trips mm. and seeing uh, so many different parts of Uganda meeting so many Ugandans who are inspiring and their commitment to building a better future for themselves, for their families, and for their communities. Okay. Your Excellency William Pope, many thanks for the perspectives on uh, the refugee interventions, but most importantly, how the United States is ensuring that uh, the burden that Uganda holds is uh, lessened in terms of uh, funding. That will do it for this uh, particular interview, but Morning at NTV will now translate.